Hello again, Chris Lee, Blake Lovell, Max Barr of Southeastern 14 here to talk about the ACC-SEC Challenge and the Wednesday night games. We've already talked about the Tuesday games. Uh, not the greatest night for the SEC, but there were some bright spots. We're looking at you, Fayetteville. Before we get into those, a reminder, our show presented by Bet Online. The last of the major pro sports leagues is off and rolling. College basketball is here as well. Bet Online remains your top spot for all your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, NHL, all in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions, all the hoops betting action, along with every sport available at your fingertips, both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today. Use the promo code Believe, that is B L E A V. For your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit, bet online where the game starts. All right, we're going to start with Florida and Wake Forest. Um, frankly, this this one surprised me. I know it was in Winston Salem. Um, Wake had not done great against other SEC teams. Florida, we we really like this team. Florida leads at halftime. Uh, what what happened here, guys? I'll start with you, Blake. Well, I mean. Look, it's Max said, you know, especially if he was looking at it from a betting standpoint, like if there's no hand locked in, I mean that, you know, it takes out another big guy on the floor and, um, so, you know, without him again, it's not ideal. They didn't shoot the ball. Great. They turned the ball over. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, <laughs> what Max, I mean, I, I think the way you just look at this game where, I think Florida still is trying to figure some things out. Like, again, I'm, I'm still really high on this team. It's not an ideal loss. Um, but I, I think you could just see kind of when the momentum started to turn, it just kept turning. Like it just, you know, they, they couldn't find a way to get it back. And so, um, yeah, I, I didn't think this was a, I don't know that my, my mind completely changes on Florida here. And I know I've said that about other teams and there, there are some teams I will be changing my mind on that we may talk about, but, um, yeah, I mean, they just, they didn't get a lot of production outside of the guys that you would have expected the production to come from, right? And, uh, I mean, you know, Richard only scores three points, and, you know, Kugel has a, a Kugel-type game. But, um, yeah, I just think elsewhere, you know, Wake Forest hit some shots. Um, you know, it's it's not the full Florida team without him logged it in there, which, you know, he would play a role. I'm not saying that they'd have won the game, or, you know, he'd have made up the difference by himself, but – um, yeah, it's just, I think it's a pretty disappointing result for Florida, but I don't know. I, I can't say that I'm just completely, and look, they had foul trouble, right? And I mean, just those kind of things. So that's how it played out for the Gators. Yeah, Blake, I like how you said you're not, you know, not panicking or anything, because I mean, listen, this team is still trying to figure out who they are. They just got back Zion Poland, who's playing starter minutes. So he's getting thrown into the rotation and then you're losing one of your front court starters. So it's like, this team hasn't played a full 40 minutes of Florida basketball yet. They're still trying to figure out who they are. First first true road game. Uh, you need Condon and Haw to step up. Condon gets in foul trouble. Haw starts getting in foul trouble. And it's just like, geez, things start breaking down. I mean, they're up at half looking good. But uh, to put a full 40 minutes of basketball on the road against a good shooting team, uh, you need your guys. And and when you don't have your guys, you need those complementary pieces to step up and, and – uh, they just didn't get enough. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by Will Richard, only only three points under 20 minutes. thought he would be a bigger piece, especially a veteran piece on the road. So, I mean, yeah, um, disappointing result, but I don't want to take too much away from it. They're still figuring it out, and I don't really think they've put together a full 40 minutes yet. All right, this next one uh, we'll talk about. Virginia 59, A&M 47. That was in Charlottesville. And I know Virginia's good, pack line defense, all those things. It might be hard for a team that doesn't see it normally. What heck, it's hard for everybody to attack. But in AM's place, particularly a, a team from out of the league that doesn't see what Tony Bennett does a lot. Still, I was disappointed. It's a veteran AM team. This doesn't appear to be one of Tony Bennett's vintage Virginia teams. And with all those weapons, guys, and I'll start with you here, Max. The Aggies only getting 47 points in Charlottesville was not something I expected to see. Well, the thing about this Virginia team is if if you play them and you only have one primary guard, you're in trouble because they probably have the best guard defender in the country in Reese Beekman. So just recipe for disaster with Tyrese Radford out. 
I hope he's okay, by the way. I mean, he's been out for a few games now, and it's it's breathing issues. They, they That's what they've kind of – that's all the reports I've seen. So yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with Tyrese Radford, if maybe he had like a little bit of a, a COVID or like a chest congestion or something, and it's taken a while. But a little bit worried about Radford, I'm not going to lie. Um, welcome back, Henry Coleman, though, 16 and 14. Guy's just a beast. Um, but really the difference in this AM offense from the Iowa State win was Solomon Washington no-show. Um, had 18 points, three or four threes last time out, and um, just just didn't show up on the offensive end uh, today, but or last night. But you mentioned Virginia, you know, may not be the the vintage Virginia. I kind of think they are. I mean, they've held opponents in the 50s or below in five out of their seven games. Uh, Ryan Dunn's a crazy good defender. So I mean, hey, you go into enemy territory against one of the best defensive teams without one of your two guards, and you get a poor result. What do you think, Blake? Well, you know, if you're Virginia, who needs a bench when you can just get all your scoring of your 59 <laughs> points from your five starters? Um, yep. If you're only going to score 59, who needs a bench, right? Just play with five. Uh, and that's kind of what they bench. did in this game. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, and no, you said it. I, it's what, I mean, is any SEC team going to play with a full group yet? I mean, I know. seven games in the season. I feel like no one has their full team. But, yeah, the, the Radford thing, he makes a difference in this game. I, I'm sure I, I said yesterday, I know exactly what I said. I said, yeah. Texas a and should be fine against Virginia because, you know, they got Wade Taylor. He doesn't turn the ball over. Well, he turned the ball over in this game. Um, and, you know, but again, that he has a lot more pressure on him in a game like this because he doesn't have that second guy that's used to being right there and taking some of that off of him. Um, so, yeah, this was tougher. You said they didn't have their traditional sort of guard group. And looking back at it, you know, if you know Radford's not going to play, yeah, this on paper is a very tough matchup just the way that Virginia plays defense. So, that's what happened here. Um, you know, again, I, I I know we love to rush the judgment on teams seven, eight games into the season. I know we love to do that. But I, I've always just been at the thought that, you know, teams play 30-something games throughout the course of a season. There haven't been a lot of teams that have won every game throughout the season. The teams are just going to lose games somewhere along the way. The good thing for Texas A&M is they're down one of their top players and they're losing games to good teams, unlike last year where they lost games to bad teams. And so, you know, they're winning some games too. The Iowa State comeback, you know, the Ohio State game on the road looks a lot better now. Um, still got Memphis, still got Houston. So, yeah, I mean, I I think A&M is honestly just fine. This is a, an ugly performance um, in a season where you're just going to have some of those at times. Uh, and once they get Radford back in the mix and everybody's back on the floor for them, still think they're a top three team in the league. Okay, th this next one, I, just the the wildest game of the night for a, a bunch of reasons. If, if you say Tennessee is going to get 37 points from Dalton Connect and he's going to miss five shots, one of those a free throw, if you say Tennessee is going to shoot 56% from the field and 81% from the line, you, you think Tennessee is probably going to win in Chapel Hill. And not only did Tennessee not win in Chapel Hill, Tennessee was down 61 to 39 and a half, made a late run and, and made it interesting within the final two minutes. Guys, uh, starting with Blake, this was I, this was not what anybody expected. I mean, you weren't surprised that North Carolina won, but seeing Tennessee give up 100 points, and for a long time it seemed it was going to be maybe more like 120 uh, I, I just don't think that was on anybody's radar. No, I mean, you know, Max, that was kind of where I'm going to go with this because we talked about this yesterday. And then I said, look, I think this is a tough spot for Tennessee. I think North Carolina is probably going to win this game. And the one thing I said was, you know, Carolina is going to shoot some free throws probably. Um, in a physical type game, they're going to get to the line and get a lot of free opportunities. And look, I mean, you know, 32 of 38 in this game. Um, Tennessee just defensively, yeah. I mean, there were certainly some things that you look back on and you're like, wait a second. If you'd asked me going in, if North Carolina in their final score has 61 points, would that surprise you? No. But would it surprise you if they have 61 of those points at halftime? <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> like, that's a little bit different. And so certainly could not have expected the first half to play out the way that it did. Um, and, you know, for Tennessee to never have a lead in the game, 
sure they would get it a little bit close, um, you know, rally from whatever 20 something down to make things interesting, you know, connect has the game that he has. And, you know, I know he rolled the ankle or whatever. Um, it didn't sound after the game, it didn't sound like it was a significant thing. Um, just, you know, uh, rolling your ankle and, you know, that can be when you do it once, um, you know, it can happen multiple times, but I know people are going to listen. I don't, Tennessee's not going to be ranked number one in our power rankings next week. Okay. I know everyone's going to jump on me for that. Cause I was the one arguing for him last week, but I still am not like, I don't know. Like I, I still think there's something there with this team. I still think they're, you know, one of the top teams in the sec. They just happen to, Again, they played Purdue, Kansas, and North Carolina uh, in three straight games, and that can take a lot out of you. It can beat you down. Uh, this was a tough road game against a good team that has a lot of you know experienced players who have been kind of in these situations before and rise to the occasion. We saw that, right? Davis, Baycott. I mean, it's just what North Carolina has done. Um, and so, but you can't give up 61 points and a half <laughs> and expect to win the game, especially against a, a top-tier team like north carolina and toby awaka being out was just huge right just it's like huge. again is is anybody yeah. going to play with their full team anywhere Apparently not league? so yeah i mean and if you told me before this game because because blake me, me and you were all over the fouls and and how how bad the the home whistle is at at dean smith center if you told me oh tennessee's backup center who honestly might have the talent to be the starter in a game like this against a big you know, strong guy like Baycott. Uh, if you told me a walk is out and you told me AD was going to get into early foul trouble, I would have been like, yep, shocker. And then look what happens. I mean, thin front court and AD gets into early foul trouble and Tennessee has to start doubling the post, kickouts to open threes. I mean, it was just like, oh, saw that one coming from a mile away. So, I mean, the same thing with you, Blake. I still like the team. I mean, you haven't played with your full set of players. Uh, Rick Barnes said that Dillion might be out a little bit longer than even expected. He said, we're still in November and we've got a long way to go. So who knows with, with Dillion there. But, I mean, you have a Waka and you have that one-two punch with Adu and a Waka instead of, like, bringing in Estrella and Kate Phillips. I mean, that changes the game. Um, Connect tied the most points ever as a visitor at the Dean Smith Center. He makes a few free throws. He breaks that record. Uh, so, I mean – yeah, disappointing result. Haven't gotten to come away with one of these big games with a win, but you also haven't had your full set of guys. And I mean, I feel good about them going forward. I just, I do. I like the way, I like the way they play. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, and look too. It's it's one of those things where like North Carolina, every opening that Tennessee gave them, North Carolina made them pay. Like literally, almost, it felt like almost shot. every time in this game that Tennessee would just give them a little bit. North Carolina would take advantage of it, whether it's, I think they had 21 points off of turnovers. Tennessee, I think had 12 turnovers in the game, um, you know, able to convert some of those in, into easy points. They hit, we talked about the free throws. They hit all 16 of the free throws in the first half. I mean, made every single one of them, um, you know, and only missed six for the game. So they go 16 to 22 in the second half to finish 32 or 38 from the line. Uh, made threes, right? Converted on the threes. They hit 12 of those. And so it's just, that's it was kind of the scenario where it's like if you're going to beat a team like Tennessee who you know what the thing we always talk about is just how good they are defensively if you're going to do that like you have to take advantage of every opportunity that they give you and North Carolina did that I mean again as you, I have ventured to, to, to tell you guys that I will make a bold prediction right now and say that Tennessee's not going to give up 61 points in the first half again this season uh, it's just probably not going to happen now, I know Kentucky is can be an offensive juggernaut. You know, Alabama can be too, but I just don't see it. Uh, but it just happened in this game, happened at the wrong time. And, you know, offensively, when you have a guy like Dalton Connect, you see what he can do. He can keep you in the game. He can probably win you a lot of games. I mean, with a performance like that, right? Like, he's probably going to win you some games just with that. It just wasn't this game because Tennessee wasn't good enough on the defensive end. And even at times where they tried to sort of lock down and, make things more difficult. Carolina just kept finding ways, um, you know, to, to do what they to, they have done. And again, that's getting the balls of their experienced players, letting them make plays. And, you know, yeah, it's just, um, we'll see with Tennessee. Uh, having a walk, would have been nice with this one. Like I said, DeLeon, I know Max talked about him heading into the season, the role he could play. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, but still, it's, it's a three-game losing streak, right, for a team that 
felt like a top 10, 10 team for a little while. And now they've lost three in a row. They haven't taken advantage of the big resume boosting opportunities against the three best teams they played to this point. And they don't have a lot of those left in the non-conference. So uh, they don't have any to this level left in the non-conference. So that's disappointing for the Vols, for sure. I, I do worry about Tennessee being a little vulnerable to venue and, and situation. I mean, if they get a tight whistle in the NCAA tournament or on the road, I think we've already seen a little bit how that goes. But uh, also, I, I was thinking back as we did this, Blake, and you probably remember it. Max wasn't with us at the time. Uh, th there's a game I'm thinking about, and it was – I found the date. And the point here being that, that Rick Barnes' teams – I mean, they were they were setting records for defensive efficiency a good bit of, of last year, and that's just kind of what they are. Uh, and, and this was, I guess, two seasons ago. <laughs> On January 15th, playing in Lexington – Kentucky 107, Tennessee 79. Uh, every, every now and then you see one of these just how did this happen outcomes with this team and the how did this happen part being, again, pointing back to how good they are defensively. What did Tennessee do? It, it won eight of its nine next games or next nine games. So just wanted to throw that out there because I was thinking about that game last night while I was watching this one unfold. Okay, yeah. gentlemen. Um Next one up, who? Boston College, 80, Vanderbilt, 62. Vanderbilt was never in that one. That was an ugly game. Jerry Stackhouse continues to do goofy things with his rotations. Tyron Lawrence um, might have hurt his wrist. They were without Colin Smith, uh, continuing the theme of teams Man. without key players. But I, I just, Blake, I think this is a team going nowhere even with the parts. Uh, Well... Boy, they're bad defensively. Um, they're 190 in Ken Palm this morning overall, not just defensively. Well, they're 286. And, and they're projected to win every – on a single-game basis, they are now going to be an underdog in every single SEC game. Well, yeah, I, I can understand that based on how uh, the, the other games are going. But, yeah, I mean, they're 286 in, in defensive efficiency right now. People say, well, you know, advanced stats and metrics and all this and that, and I get it, but – when you consider that they're 286 and the next closest SEC team is a Chris Beard coached Ole Miss team at 115, who is going to probably only get better defensively. That's not ideal. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot to add on this like that. That shouldn't happen. Um, but again, it's, I say that, right. And it, you feel like this was a game you, you could win because again, Boston college is not, I don't know. I don't even, you know, Earl Grant, I, I think is a good coach, but it's just, it's a hard job and it's a hard place to win consistently. And, um, you know, this isn't the vintage Boston college teams of what the Jared Dudley days and all this, like, I'm like having to really go back here. Um, Al Skinner. There you go. Al Skinner. That's, he was the coach. And so it's, yeah. So, so I mean, but I mean, I'm going to say the same thing here. It's like, I don't know what Vanderbilt's record is right now. If they have every player, that was supposed to start the season available to start the season and playing in every game to this point. It it's going to look different. I, I truly think that I don't think it's going to be to the level that, you know, they're, they're pushing for an NCAA tournament bid by any means, but it probably will look different once they get everybody back on the floor. But right now, this is what we have to work with. And the results haven't been pretty to this point. I mean, how many times are we going to say like, I don't want to take too much away from this because they don't have their full team. I feel like it's like every team in the SEC. Vanderbilt's yeah. played seven games. They don't have one game yet with their full squad. So it's like, I mean, this game was Lawrence and Mannion's first game together this season. No Smith still, who's a big piece. You don't get the shooting night from Evan Taylor and the wheels fall off. It's just like, do you take the defense? Yeah, it's it's not looking good. You could really use a, a Liam Robbins right now. Uh, but, I mean, do you take – like a ton away. I mean, it's just, it's hard to really take a definite conclusion from it when they don't have their lineup. Uh, Ezra Mannion, five turnovers, two assists. He was forcing it a little bit, but yeah, I mean, Boston college jumps out to a 17 to five lead and the game's pretty much over there. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to say much. Yeah. Defensively too. I just want to point this out, you know, in ooh, five of their seven games this season, teams have shot 42.1 percent or better from three 10 of 20 usc upstate um 
Central Arkansas, 7 of 13. NC State, 8 of 19. Arizona State, 10 of 22. Boston College, 10 of 20. So, you know, it's just, it's given up a lot of, a lot of points at the three point rate. Like, and that's just, those add up. And, you know, that's, that's not helped this uh, situation. So, well, and that's, that's probably some bad luck. But if we're painting around the yeah. edges under these circumstances, then <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, not hold on, but, but hold on. Way. It may be bad luck. I get it. But like, that's five of the seven games you played in. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're talking bad luck to teams like Presbyterian. Oh, okay. It, I, I mean, that saying. that's that's the bigger point I'm making. I but, thought you just meant the, the shooting. Okay. I well, mean. no, I mean, I think three-point defense, I, I don't know if the research is updated. It used to be the thing was that three-point defense was a little bit random, more so than two-point defense. I have not looked at the advanced I research would, I on think that that's, that's fair because, okay. I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think it is a little more random, but – I mean, at the same time, if the, the pattern continues and it's, you know, we don't have a huge sample size yet, but I mean, I'm just, all I'm saying is you're giving up three points versus two points, right? And if you're giving up 10, 10 of those in three of your six games and other teams are shooting a high percentage of the ones they are taking from that, that's adding an extra point each time, right? So it's, yeah, that's all I'm saying. Like that adds up to where you can lose games the way that they've lost some of these games. So. Well, my, my point would be you can explain it away however you want to explain it, but you know even with the injuries and and the the bad three point luck to call it that just for argument's sake, um, good, good teams are experiencing that and still winning these games by twenty points and they're not. So yeah, we we are hitting on something that is not Vanderbilt's biggest issue. We are just, yeah the three three point defense is not their biggest problem. I can yeah tell you they that. they got a lot of problems. Um, Hey, here's here's one that surprised I think a lot of people, and and they trailed at half, but but Georgia pulls one out late against Florida State. Georgia now four and three, sixty eight to sixty six final there, and and that one was in Tallahassee. Um, yeah, I mean balanced scoring effort, four guys in double digits. Georgia shoots forty percent from the field, and it gets out rebounded. But it only turns it over ten times, uh, which always helps when you're playing on the road. Max, I'll let you start here. What did you take away? With just under about eight minutes left, Georgia had the ESPN like uh, live game tracker gave Georgia a zero point six percent chance of winning with about like seven thirty left. So incredible comeback. Uh, but the, the way they came back, I just I don't think it's uh, sustainable. You got zero points from your front court. Russell Chiwa and, and, and Deloach combined for zero points, nine rebounds, uh, but six fouls and two turnovers. I just – I need more production out of the front court. Um, and, the, I mean, Florida State's got big guys. I mean, they've got a ton of length. They always do. Leonard Hamilton always has a few seven-footers. But still, I mean, if you're going to win games on the road consistently, you're going to have to get some easy points in the paint. It can't just be all guard play oriented, one-on-one -on -one dribbling and stuff. So, uh, yeah, good result. I mean, hey. I think that's a huge win for Mike White and the momentum going forward. It might might kind of change the momentum of this program this season, but gosh, I just I need more from the front court. Mike White was one and six against Florida State entering this game. Um and to do it in this kind of fashion where you're down seventeen with six and a half to go, basically. Wild. Um I don't wow. want to call it a season saving win either, but man, that's a huge win for Georgia because I mean, like we said, they they played some interesting games so far, right? Like five of their first seven games have come against power conference teams. You know, not a lot of SEC teams have had to played that schedule at this point. Um, you know, have they played a top ten team yet? Well, they did play Miami, I guess. Um, but Miami probably not there right now after the Kentucky game. But like they've played quality competition. I think it's fair to say. You know, got the win over Wake Forest, who just beat Florida. Um you know, Florida State, I, I, I said this going into the Florida game. Like, I don't think this is Leonard Hamilton's best team by any means, but I don't think they're terrible. Um, and so to win the game the way that they did, I don't think we can even say what that can do for a team momentum-wise and just from a confidence standpoint, to find a way to win that kind of game. When, remember, let's, again, let's keep in mind who we're talking about here. We're talking about the Georgia basketball team. We're not talking about the Georgia football game, team. We're talking about the basketball team that is still – 
not that far removed from a six and 26 season and the bottom basically falling out to where Mike White comes in last year and they win 16 games. They start finding ways to win some of these close games. And now, you know, you come into this season, you've already found a way to win some close games, right? The Wake Forest game at home, that's a three point game. Um, even the other games they play, North Carolina Central, Winthrop, like those are 10 point or less type games. You rally from 17 down here on the road and you find a way to, to win. And again, against a team historically that Mike White's not had a lot of success against. So the rest of their non-conference schedule, they got one, two, three. They got six straight home games before they play at Missouri on January the 6th. So the entire month of December, they're at home. They could reel off wins in every single one of those games and, you know, go into conference play 10 and three. That'd be a great spot for Georgia. Uh, because again, they only won 16 games last year, right? And so I don't think we can even kind of underestimate just how important this kid win could be for this Georgia team, the way this team is made up, uh, because they have a lot of pieces too that they're trying to figure out and to kind of show the the grit that they showed and watching how they played in the, that final stretch of this game. Yeah, I think they – Give them credit because this was one where, again, they could have easily just wound up getting beat by 20, but they found a way to win. All right, next one up. Auburn beats Virginia Tech 74-57, to that one in Auburn. Uh, Aiden Holloway wasn't good at all, no points in 22 minutes. But guess who was? Janai Broom, who goes for 30, 13, and three blocks and picked up just one foul, 11 of 19 from the field. Uh, guys, we, we kind of debated what to do with Auburn in our power rankings, a team we didn't know what to do with. But I, I think this will be one m- moving up starting next week, Max. Oh, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll win that convincingly while going 2 of 16 from three-point range and losing the rebound battle. Well, the reason you do that is because you force 21 turnovers and get 30 points off of them. This defense is nasty. They're lengthy, athletic, active hands. They force a ton of turnovers. There's a reason they have, I'm pretty sure it's the number one three-point defense in the nation right now. Uh, they're averaging only like 20. That's number four. Number four. They're averaging only like 23% against from, from other teams. I mean, Chad baker Mazar, 24 minutes. Finally. Come on. I've been calling for more baker Mazar minutes. Finally. The guy's dynamic out there. Uh, so, I mean – Hey, this is a team that can win multiple ways. They've they've been proven that a few times now. They can afford for guys to have off nights. It's not they don't have to have every single guy on their A game every night. You had ten players play double digit minutes. This team's deep. I like Auburn moving forward, Blake. Yeah, I mean, look, you you had them second in your individual rankings this week, right? So um, yep. if if you move them up, they're going to be the number one team in the SEC next week, Mal. We are I worry to... that that won't be the case, but you'll be fine leaving them at two, perhaps. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've talked about Auburn. I don't think they've really been outside of my top, I don't know, five, I think, most of the season. Um, yeah, and and this was another one where it's just like they just keep winning games. I mean, they just they just keep finding ways to win, and, you know, what, they've beaten all of their opponents by double digits at this point. Um and, you know, lost that game to Baylor, which, as we said, remember, I mean, that feels like forever ago now, but should have won that game. Like, so, you know, again, how different is the conversation right now for people if Auburn just has that one win against Baylor? Like, I don't know that they've changed mm-hmm. that much. Now, the one thing it has changed, right, is very simple. Defensively, they're playing a lot better. Um, you know, for them to be able to win a game like this where they, I mean, I, I mean, they didn't, they weren't great offensively. Um, you know, 2 of 16 from 3, like you said, and yeah, they just weren't great there, but they made up for it by getting the extra opportunities on the offensive glass. Um, now, you know, Sir Bruce Pro won't be happy with how many they gave up on the other side in terms of Virginia Tech getting those extra chances, but they didn't capitalize on them. They only had 57 points, right? So they didn't take advantage of those extra um, looks off the, you know, the glass. So, yeah, I think that's the one thing for me that's very clear. Um, Janai Broom is Janai Broom. There's <laughs> no surprise there, but offensively this team may still have some ups and downs but they as long as they keep improving on defense they are going to have a chance against everybody um and, and that's what what it comes down to right because the, the efficiency numbers look a lot better now and that's where i think again ken palm love it can be a little deceiving sometimes like in terms of just the overall picture you know is auburn playing like a top 10 team defensively the entire season i don't know i think mostly a lot of that 
if you just kind of look at those first couple games, specifically that Baylor game, right? I mean, that's the one that's the most glaring. But it is the best team he played to this point, too. So um, they've gotten better since that point. And I think that's what this comes down to, is to see them continue to improve defensively, to hold this Virginia Tech team to 57 points, to win a game like this, kind of going away, right, on a night where you're not playing great offensively. Yeah, I, I mean, how do you how do you knock Auburn for that? Like, you're finding ways to win, and um, yeah, this this team continues to move up, in in my opinion, just because I think you're starting to see them really do what Bruce Pearl wants them to do, and that is be more consistent defensively, and the numbers are supporting that. So, all right, Blake. All right, well, it's been a good show. Um, Southeastern fourteen. Hit the subscribe <laughs> button. Hit the like button. Um, we got a lot of football content, Georgia versus Alabama, SEC championship game on Saturday. We'll be talking baseball at some point soon. Um, and, yeah, I think that's all we got here. So, Chris, you can lead us on out. Unbelievable. <clears throat> Please, Arkansas do you fans, think you guys – do you really? Do you guys really think I'm going to give up the opportunity to cut a promo here on the fact that – how many times do I have to do this, Chris? Every single time – that I go into these Arkansas games that feel like huge games. What do I, I always say? Like, I'm like, guys, there's just something about this game. It started a couple years ago with the Gonzaga game. It went last year to the Kansas game. And now it's the Duke game. Now, <laughs> I feel like, Chris, it is a running theme. Every time we're like, you know what? There's something about this where a lot of people are doubting Arkansas. A lot of people think Arkansas have no, that there's no chance in this game but yet must does this time and time again with this Arkansas team. Just when you think they have no chance, just when you think that everyone is about to count them out, they rise to the occasion. They get sort of that defining win. And this may ultimately be it. It is for right now because they, you know, they get a win over Duke here um, without Tremont Mark and, I mean, we talked about it, Max. I mean, I I literally went back as I'm watching the game last night. I'm like, I couldn't remember exactly what we said about the game, but I'm like, I know Max went money line on this. I know he went Arkansas money Ooh. line. Um, I told you that I was definitely taking Arkansas points, and I also was very tempted to do the money line. Now, what Arkansas fans don't know here on the YouTube channel and or the podcast feed is that I did a, them a favor in this game, and Max knows what I'm going to say here. I went reverse mojo just for you, Arkansas fans, because in the college basketball pick'em contest run by none other than Max Barr himself on Twitter, I went and said, Max, give me Duke here because <laughs> I wanted to make sure we gave all the the mojo in, in, in the way for Arkansas. And so they did it, guys. I mean, they came out and got the win. The must bus has pulled over. It's gassed up, premium unleaded. Um, all the snacks are in the back seat. Tremont Mark is sitting there just smiling. He may be injured, but he's okay. Um, you know, got the massager, the heat's on the back, all this other stuff. And the hogs are now five and three on the season. There's just something about when a team loses a key piece in that next game, that first game after an injury, they just come out with with just an extra punch. I mean, this game was one with energy. I mean, or you could tell Arkansas was just flying around the court. I mean, people are going to be talking about Brazil. People are going to be talking about uh, battle. How about Chandler Lawson? Just kind of owning Filipowski. Six blocks. I mean, he looked phenomenal. I was very impressed with Chandler Lawson. Uh, I mean, yeah, that minus four and a half for Duke just, I mean, that's how I woke up in the morning. Yesterday morning, I'm sound asleep, and I just get this whiff of this gross, nasty stench. I'm like, what is that? Oh, it's Duke minus four and a half. It stinks. <laughs> I mean, all the all the signs were just pointing to Arkansas having a little bounce back game. Is Bud Walton like, like the number one home court advantage? I mean, they've got to be worth like four or five points on the spread. Uh, yeah, I'm just – I'm happy because we, we read this game right. I think we had the right read on it, and uh, this is just – it's a good step in the right direction. And it's nice to see Trevon Brazil finally take, like, that big – you know, that big game that he needed. We, we predicted him first team all SEC. So, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the result. 
Gentlemen, parting thoughts. I'll, I'll give you mine, then I'll go to Max, then I'll go to Blake. I'm I'm a little disappointed in the SEC. I don't know what the final tally in this one was. I think the ACC got him by a couple games. What was the no, split. It was even. Was it split? Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's just where I am with my expectations for the league. Um, but here there's a lot Debbie of basketball Downer. to play. Arkansas gets a season-defining <laughs> win, and here comes Chris into <laughs> running in with his hold on everyone wait just a second let me tell you why the sec is terrible at basketball that's it we're kicking you out of the kicking you out of the recording studios chris you're, you're done for me and max are going to talk about arkansas for the next half hour <laughs> i'm glad to see you don't take any license with what i say none <laughs> i thought there were some there were some bad parts but there were also some really good parts i mean we had yeah we had a few huge wins uh old mess just destroying NC State. Arkansas was up by 14 against Duke. Like they could have really ran away with that game. Um, you know, you had some 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 bad results, but I mean, you split you split seven seven. ACC might be a little bit better this year. I mean, Clemson looks like a top 25 team. Yeah. So I I would have liked to win. You know, I would have liked the SEC to have the edge, but I'm not I'm not walking away like oh gosh. You know, I think we're okay. And look, teams we all know this, but teams are not. <laughs> in November, what they're going to be, you know, right. in February and March. And I think that's just, I always try to keep it in that context. And especially in this era, I think that is more the case. I, yeah. I think year after year, we just see more teams trying a lot of things early on and yeah. trying to figure out what they have. And I see a lot of people say, well, what do you mean? They don't know what they have. They've had them all off season. They've had it understood, but you're not playing against anyone else. You're playing against your own team. Like it's, it's just a different setting. It's a different, situation when you get in live game situations with you know ten thousand people in the crowd or whatever it's different than doing it in practice with eight people there and you know right. it's trying to figure out who are the guys that are going to rise to the occasion who are the guys that are going to be able to play in this spot you know when we need them in this particular rotation like we are only seven games into the season eight games into the season there are teams i would venture to say most teams around the country are still figuring that out I don't want to say everyone, but most teams are figuring those things out. And I think a lot of SEC teams are because why? It's not an excuse, but it's the reality of the situation. There are a lot of teams that are still playing not at full strength. There are still guys that aren't in the rotation that are going to be in the rotation a month from now, two months from now, into March. Like, And I think that's it. You're going to have some of these results that are feel disappointing in the moment. And and some of these are, like we said, there are some losses that just, they are disappointing, period. The way you play, you know, Tennessee, high expectations. You can't give up 61 points and a half. I don't care what you think about the officiating, anything like that. You know, we talked about teams like right. Vanderbilt losing those kind of games, all that. A&M, sure, it's frustrating to only score 47 points on the road and lose a game that way. But still a long way to go. Um, the top end teams have given away a lot of opportunities, and I feel like yeah. that's kind of been a theme in the SEC over the past several years. Um, yes. I think it is that combination, Chris, where it's like you have teams who have either given away, you know, possible top five type wins. You've also had teams lose games they shouldn't. We've seen that double whammy already for the SEC this season, and we're only, like I said, a quarter of the way into the season, basically. So in that regard, yes, I think there's, there's some disappointing uh, ways to look at it, but I also try to remember that this is the transfer era. This is an era where yeah. every, pretty much every team feels different. Not every single team, but a lot of teams are just so much different year in and year out now. And it's just the nature, I think, of how things work. Um, again, they're like, well, it doesn't affect Purdue or it doesn't affect – still, right? It's just every situation is different, and I think you've got a lot of SEC teams that are still trying to <laughs> figure out exactly who they are. Meanwhile, you've got some other teams that feel like, Maybe they've completely figured it out, whether it's Kentucky, who still is not at full strength. Auburn, like we said, I think is a team that's certainly trending up in the right direction. Um, everybody else, you know, there's still a lot to be determined in terms of how they fare in, in these kind of games this early in the season. Well, I'll tell you what I think it is. It's it's we have been – like we've been really big on Tennessee, right? I, I, I And I get it's it's – look at where they lost and who they lost to. I just I wanted better for the league than to see Tennessee go, you know, lose all three of those games. I, I thought beat at least beat one of those. You feel a little better. Um, 
you know, seen Florida, which I thought was getting somewhere, lose to a Wake team that a couple other SEC teams have beaten and is frankly probably an NIT level team. Um, I want to see Alabama beat Clemson at home. I, I think my expectations for the league are just so high. I spent my offseason scouring through the rosters, looking at the just the massive number of talented players that they brought in. It's all it, guys. It's almost too much to keep up with. Um, but it, but it, Blake, I do think you said something that's pertinent at the same time. I was watching a game last night. ESPN threw up a graphic, and it was percentage of points scored by players who played for you last year or something like that. And and just the percentages of of points <laughs> scored by new guys is just going up and up and up and up every year. And the number for last year was like over twice what it was four or five years ago. And, of course, we know why. It's the portal. It's NIL. It's all these things. But I'm sure the number's going to be even higher this year. And, Blake, that's where I think you made a good point. Um, just about every team is in some state of transience. Um, and and it's, it's hard to look at this game the way we did three, four, five years ago even. How many teams have, and I'm looking at this now, I, I don't have everybody's stats pulled up, so don't. But, I mean, how many teams in the SEC have the same leading score at the top, the same go-to guy at the top as they had a season ago? Auburn? I'm going to just pull something up. I'm going to look at if, if they've A&M. updated. Yeah. Who else? <laughs> I mean, Vanderbilt, uh, maybe. But, like, they haven't had their full team yet. So, like, I don't even know if we can actually classify that as of this point. But Okay, I'll, I'll run down the list. Uh, top score in the league right now, Mark Sears. Alabama was there a year ago. Dalton Connect, Tennessee, but was it Northern Colorado a year ago? Alan Flanagan, three. Ole Miss was at Auburn a year ago. Antonio Reeves, four. Kentucky was there a year ago. Wade Taylor, five, was there a year ago. Um, I, I can go on, but it's it is a mixed bag. Yeah, but I think there's more than not that don't have their top one, two, three, whatever. Um, you know, yeah, Sears, but Sears wasn't re- required to be the top guy. It was. Right. That was somebody else. Um, and so yeah, that that's it. Like, but again, most conferences can say that too. And so you can probably say that if your team's in the Big Twelve, Big Ten, Big East, whatever. Um, but I just think that leads to more inconsistent results this early on when you only have a very small no. sample size of games. I mean, because like I said, it's you know, eight games of football is oh man, that's you know, three quarters of a season. Eight games of basketball, you got a long way to go before it really matters to that extent, but it does matter early on too, because, you know, this is where you build your resume outside of just sec play. You know, you don't have the sec big 12 challenge in late January anymore. This is it. Like this is all you got. Once you get to December, end of December, like that's all you got. You don't have another one of those games that every year, right. For the, for many years, we're like, Hey, that game can really boost your resume. You're struggling sec play. Here's a way to go out and get a quality win. You only got your sec schedule to do that now. So and guys, it's important to remember also, like looking at the conference, I don't know if the ACC, Big East, Big 12 is like this. Over half the conference has injury problems right now. Yeah. Or is not at full strength. Yeah. Over half. I think it's like eight or nine teams are missing either a starter or a key bench piece. And so it's like we do these reaction videos and, and so many times I'm saying, well, it's hard to draw a conclusion because they didn't have blah, blah, blah. They didn't have, blah, blah, you know, and so it's like, is the conference, you know, not getting some of the results at the top half that we want. Yes. But is Awaka and DeLeona for Tennessee? Yes. Does, te- does Kentucky not have three, seven footers? Yes. You know, it's like, does Texas A&M not have Bradford and have Ned Coleman and don't have Marble? So it's like, it's, you know, States without one of the top three players in the league without a conference <laughs> yeah. player of the year. So it's like yeah. some of the best players in the conference right now aren't even playing. Well, and, and to y'all's point, I'm just doing a, a, a quick count of it. And, and this, of course, doesn't include the guys that aren't playing, as you pointed out. But the, of the guys who are playing, top 20 scores in the SEC right now, 13 of them were playing for different teams this time a year ago. That includes high schools. Um, also, that does not include the, the guy who's who's maybe the best player in the league so far, um, Reed Shepard at Kentucky, who's not one of the top 20 scores. So that 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 says a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, we'll see. We'll see how things unfold for here. The schedules get a little more lenient for certain teams 
um, the rest of the way. So bad loss avoidance is now the theme for a lot of teams in the SEC yeah. because there just have not been a lot of them that have capitalized on good win opportunities. So got to keep those bad losses off the resume uh, before you head into to league play. So, All right. I think that's a wrap on – things today we'll be back again soon with more sec basketball content we're doing power rankings we're doing predictions we're doing reactions every week best way to get that hit the subscribe button hit the like button god bless everybody have a great day thank you for watching southeastern 14 presented by bet online